as most of you know, our program turns 100 this year, and so I think it's particularly fitting that as a part of this centennial, we have the opportunity to celebrate education and learn from some of our most beloved faculty. So our first CPE session this afternoon is led by Professor John Robinson and Kevin Levingston. Uh, it's probably an understatement, but Professor Robinson has been the backbone of our accounting department from a tax perspective for the last 27 years. In that time, he's also become a very well-respected and well-published member of the academic community. Kevin Levingston is a partner in, Atlant in PwC's Atlanta office. He also spent some time working for the Joint Committee on Taxation. And most importantly, he is also a graduate of our accounting program. So John and Kevin, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, I don't know if I've ever been described as a backbone before. <laughs> it's usually lower down than that. <laughs> So um, uh, welcome, and it's good to see so many faces that I recognize. Um, and uh, as uh, um, Christina was mentioning, it's our 100th birthday. And this is a picture, I understand, of the 1921 BBA graduating class. And it, you know we have this on our screensavers, some of us. But you can't make out the detail. And you know I was up here looking, and I could swear, Ed, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> probably not, probably not. Oh, okay, so, um, so uh, what we're going to cover today is we're going to, our, our title was uh, risk management and, um, uh, and tax reform. And what our idea was here was to talk a little bit about uh, a topic that would appeal to have a wide audience. So managers, auditors, tax accountants. And so what we're trying to do is, uh, is give you an idea of where the risks are, and if you are in, interested in governance from a management perspective, an audit perspective, uh, it would give you some uh, inclination to understand how taxes affect risk. So uh, that's where the title comes from. Um, one of the things I mentioned at the start is uh, our, we have lots of material, we can go through slides, but we'd be much more interested in a little Q&A, so if you have questions, you have comments, we'd love to hear them, and we'll interact with them. So both Kevin and I are, sure. are amenable to that. So the next slide basically talks about the key areas we're going to talk about. Kevin's going to start off by talking about tax risks and, and tax reform. And specifically, he's going to talk about the budget outlook and the tax reform analysis. Kevin's experience uh, it was two years in a joint committee in Washington. And so he's well qualified to talk about where we've been and where we're going. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some specific areas in judgments for uh, accounting for income taxes. Specifically, we're going to talk about uncertain positions, indefinite uh, uh, reinvestment assertions, evaluation allowances, if we get that far. But we'll go, like I said, as fast as you want us to. Um, we've got lots of content here, so there's no hurry. Now, to sort of put this in a little bit more context, uh, we have this slide. And basically, what this slide's trying to do is identify the various areas of tax risk that uh, when you're operating an enterprise that you might worry about. From an operational viewpoint, what you're really talking about there is hiring, training, and supervising your employees and making sure you retain them, making sure you have the policies in place to uh, control your tax risk, you have the expertise in place to identify tax risk. Uh, from an enterprise situation, you're talking about uh, your reputation, your ability to interact on a multilateral setting with your, with your clients, uh, tax and strategy uh, and how that uh, interacts uh, uh, between your business strategy uh, and your savings. Uh, we're going to focus on regulatory. In particular, we're gonna, Kevin's going to talk about legislative changes. And my three areas are judgments in terms of doing financial reporting for taxes. Uh, but, we're, uh, but you could also talk about from a transactional viewpoint. From a transactional viewpoint, your, ta your, uh, your tax risks come in because you're uh, engaging in transactions, most companies, in multiple jurisdictions. If you're not global, then you're going to be multi-state. What you have there is multiple uh, uh, tax uh, um, laws, and they're evolving over time, so you have to keep on top of those, uh, the, that evolution. Moreover, with the tax authorities, they're evolving over time. Now that we have our, our problems with our budgets, as we're going to see in a minute, the tax authorities are becoming much more aggressive. And so you not only have to keep a tab on 
how these taxes are influencing you from a multi, uh, from a multi uh, uh, country perspective, but also because they're in constant motion. Yeah. Kevin? Yeah, and, and the only thing I would add, just maybe, a, you know, we all naturally look very US centric, but, you know, one example is, you know, India is one of the, uh, the markets that US and foreign multinationals are expanding into quite a bit. And, you know, we're talking with someone at a, a, a client that has operated in India for, for several years. There was a big case there, this Vodafone case, where India went uh, kind of extraterritorial and tried to tax capital gains, uh, you know, at a level, at, a, at an entity level well above India. So you had uh, Vodafone that owned a holding company that owned another holding company that owned an, an Indian company. And, you know, shares were sold, Vodafone caught it, and the Indian government went after them. Well, it ultimately went up to the, the Supreme Court after about five or six years, and Vodafone ended up winning. Uh, but talking to this uh, VP of tax, he said, look, you know, when you're going into a place like India where things are still developing, the, the agent there, rather than necessarily trying to get to a result of, all right, here's what the tax law says, uh, we're going to apply it, which is maybe more similar to the way it's done here in the U.S., Right now, where it's at is that they look at it and say, all right, what is a good theory as to how I can raise some revenue here? And they're going to apply that regardless of what the tax law says. And then that, that's fine. That's what their job is to do. Your job, in turn, is to decide whether or not you want to challenge that. And ultimately, if you continue to go all the way up to the, uh, the Supreme Court, which may take four, six, you know, ten years to do, you ultimately will win and get to the right answer, but that's just kind of the nature of things, and that's not just in India. That's around the world where the, uh, the tax systems are evolving and people need revenue. And so, you know, in terms of this corporate governance and risk, companies need to accept the fact that, hey, you know, I may want to take, be very conservative. I'm going to take, even if I want to take all conservative positions and report those, you still may not, uh, you know, not avoid or are not likely going to avoid you know, audit risk, and so you need to just be prepared and accept that there's some level of risk that your organization is going to be able to, uh, you know, to handle and make sure that everyone in the organization is bought in with that and decide how you're going to tackle it. Well, even if you're not a global company, right. I think you run the same risk at the state level. Certain states have been very aggressive in terms of taxing entities' income, and again, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a likelihood that it, what you will not be able to do is settle at the state level. You'll end up litigating. Uh, and so uh, I think the India example is, an ex is extreme and in, in only in the sense that it's become public. I think there are many other uh, examples that you might find where the, the tax authority simply said, we're going to take this to the, there's just too much revenue and we have too much need. So we're going to take it to the, to the bottom line. Um, you want to talk a little bit about tax reform? Sure, sure. So. I was at the, the Joint Committee on Taxation, from, which is a nonpartisan committee that helps all the members of Congress, mostly Ways and Means and Senate Finance, develop tax legislation. So it was very interesting being in a nonpartisan role on, uh, on Capitol Hill, and you'd help one group actually develop a piece of legislation, uh, and then when it became hub public, you'd then help another group figure out ways to shoot that down. So it was a constant, uh, constant state of being in a conflict of interest, so as long as you didn't uh, share confidences, you were okay. But sometimes it was uh, you know, easier said than than done, but when I was there it was from March of 2009 until actually about October of, of last year. So I got to see really the, the first you know, couple years is when the Democrats were firmly in control of the House and the Senate and, and the executive branch. So there was a lot that, that moved through, I don't need to tell you all that, a lot that moved through a Congress. Then ultimately the Republicans took control of the House and so a bit more uh, gridlock, at least in terms of with, with the legislation. And so the time there was more focused long-term on tax reform. A lot of that was kind of behind the scenes. So kind of I got, I feel like I got in that two and a half year period, kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, you know, working on lots of little revenue raisers that have now, you know, wreaked havoc for my, uh, my clients again, now that I'm back at PwC, as well as looking at some things more uh, long-term. So this is really in terms of the budget and a lot of what the, the noise has been about. And just to give you a feel, if you look at it, over the past 40 years, the U.S. has been in an average historical deficit of about 3%. Now, that's actually viewed as a sustainable deficit because the economy has typically grown at at least 3%. GDP has grown at that rate, so that's viewed as sustainable. You can manage that. Uh, obviously, what happened was is you got to, uh, you know, really to, you know, what everything that happened in late 2008, early 2009, to where the deficit now in 2011 actually was at about 8.7%, uh, so clearly something that is is not sustainable. Now, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, one of the other few nonpartisan groups uh, that, that works on the Hill, actually puts out their 10-year baseline because the way things work, the, the budget, it's as if 10 years is all the outlook that, that is looked at. So it's as if nothing exists 
after 10 years. That's just the way that it is done. Uh, also, the way they score things, it's nominal, so there's no present value to, uh, to any of this because no one could agree to what the proper discount rate would be. Uh, so for 10 years, they look and say, okay, if the, the projections right now, if you're looking out to 10 years and you, know, you look out here, you'd actually say, and this is actually the top black line there, the CBO March 2012 baseline, you'd see that you'd actually get to where the deficit uh, would be actually be about 3.1 trillion looking out 10 years to 2022, which actually you can see right there, that's well below the 3% deficit. That's really only about a 2% deficit. So if you look at that and say, if, if Congress were to go home today and do absolutely nothing, um, you know, not looking at the broader economy and the, uh, in the, in the fiscal cliff and what might happen, but if they were to go home and do nothing, uh, then, you know, and all the, uh, the tax cuts were allowed to expire and everything else, then in theory, this is where we would be. Of course, there have been follow-up reports that have shown the CBO has said that we'll have this fiscal cliff because if we don't extend the tax cuts and we do allow everything to go through the, uh, the sequestrations and everything else, then potentially you, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the country will go back into a, a recession. So we'll see what happens. But I, always, I, I laugh when I look at it to say if Congress did nothing and allowed everything to expire, we would actually, at least, for, at least initially, from a deficit perspective, based on these projections, everything would uh, would be fine. Of course, looking at that in a vacuum. How the alternative, though? Uh, I, I, one of the things, Kevin, to interrupt, yeah. uh, uh, I found interesting about this is not is everybody pretty much agrees that if they do nothing, uh, there's a increases the likelihood of a recession by by a significant amount. Yep. And to understand that black line, that's the, it. It assumes no recession, so it's. Uh, the baseline here, it seems to me, is, is pretty unrealistic. That's right. It does assume, when they do this at the beginning of the year, it is a fixed GDP that is assumed. So, uh, so that creates a lot of, of, of controversy. So that is you know, unrealistic. The alternative pro projection, though, looking at this in a vacuum, is that Congress will continue to do what they have always done. And you know, once something has been extended once in D.C., the general view is that it's going to continue. It's effectively permanent. It's just got to be renewed and renewed and renewed. So the alternative projection assumes that you know, everything would continue to be extended, all of the corporate tax extenders and the individual rate cuts at 35 and 15% you know, and, and, and so on and so forth would continue to be extended. And really, we ended up at a $12.2 trillion deficit. And uh, so that's the other end of it. The other thing that's assumed here, though, is with that is that the, there's the, the Medicare doc fix, other things that are non-tax related that you know, I think uh, most people think are, are good that need to be handled so that uh, doctors get their reimbursements and ultimately people are being, uh, being served, as well as the AMT patch is another thing that's assumed that continues to be extended here. So it's a mix. And then in between, you've got what uh, the Obama administration has proposed, which would actually get you back to a 3% historical deficit. And that, without getting the details, that assumes that you will have some increase in spending as well as a decrease in revenues uh, you know, to get to that level. And then you've got the, the House budget resolution, which is kind of commonly referred to as the Ryan plan, which really assumes some increase, you know, some decrease in revenues, or actually a lot of decrease in revenues, as well as a very big decrease in spending. And right, the, the devil's in the detail. There's a lot of, you know, I think you look at it and say, well, that that's great on both both angles. Both of them get us back to a sustainable deficit or something even better than that. Uh, but there's a lot of controversy in the details of how you go about doing that. So. I would say that would be built into the, uh, you know, and I, I don't know whether or not the CBO, uh, you know, if they were included, I would say that would be included in the alternative projection, if anything, because, uh, right, you know, some would say now that that has happened twice, is it arguably now something that's going to become permanent? I mean, it's interesting. Chairman Camp of Ways and Means said, you know, when they negotiated on this earlier in the year to extend the payroll tax cut, he said, never again, we're not going to do this again. But, you know, I would say that's, you know, famous last words. And really, you can kind of look at it. Once something is extended twice in Washington, it tends to have a, you know, a, a life into itself. So I would say it, it probably has been accounted for in the alternative projection. But it's you know, going back here, this, uh, this top black line assumes that everything is allowed to expire. Well, and, and that would also include uh, the Medicare tax that's, uh, that's now legislated. I'm sure that's in the, in the projection. Yeah, so that would certainly be included. And that's right, that would be included in uh, and that one right there is something that's going to be out there. But and, and obviously, the, the Supreme Court upheld, uh, you know, the you know, health care legislation. Uh, however, will you know? I think you know. There's obviously there've been been threats that uh, you know if if uh, Romney you know wins a presidency or if the uh, the Re Republicans take over the Senate and maintain the House, combined with that, that they would somehow you know pursue a, uh, a repeal of that legislation. And 
and that uh, that would certainly you know, lose revenue and had to be make, made up with uh, elsewhere. So. Could each of these lines have different GDP assumptions? All would have the, uh, the same fixed GDP assumption. So. Same. Yeah, so that's right. So that is a good point. That, you know, what's that? Including the, the Ryan plan. It, it does, well, I'll say this, in terms of the way it's charted right here, now I'll tell you, in terms of what he put out, it would assume more growth than the growth in the economy and the fact that reducing taxes and going potentially to a territorial tax system would, you know, it, you know uh, the view would be that, uh, you know, that would ultimately grow the economy because the U.S. would be a more attractive place to invest. But in terms of the, the official scorekeeping that the CBO does, they, they will not take that into account, which is actually, I mean, I, it's, that is one of the big issues and one of the things that the, uh, that has been pushed, I mean, it, both sides of the aisle, but primarily by the, the Republicans saying, hey, this is, you know, reducing the corporate tax rate to 25% and doing some of these other things is going to make the U.S. more, uh, you know, more competitive, therefore there's going to be more investment, and frankly, all the scoring and the scoring that the Joint Committee on Taxation's economists do, that assumes a fixed GDP. You're not taking into account this growth in the, uh, the economy. The problem is, it's, and as I'm sure many of you know who uh, who have dealt with economic models, it's very difficult to do that on an economy our size. I mean, a you know a 0.1 percent differential on what you know 14, 15 trillion dollars makes a big difference on scorings. But that is a a a, a big challenge. Is you know how do you really you know measure what is going to be the uh, the effect on a macro macro perspective? So what what does happen is, and they did do it with healthcare reform, is that even though it's not considered the official score, when for a big bill like healthcare reform. The JCT was required with CBO to actually do an analysis of what kind of the macroeconomic effect would be. However, that's not actually viewed as the official score for purposes of the uh, of the bill. So uh, yeah, you'll see, I think, over time, more of a push, and there've been hearings on it to try to do some more macroeconomic modeling. But it's very, uh, I think, you know, very very challenging. So. Looking back at this very quickly before we uh, move on, this just kind of shows you how, you know, if you look at it. In the time frame through, you know, up before 2012, kind of revenues and spending kind of stayed relatively close together, getting you to kind of your 40-year your historical average of 3% deficit in GDP. Then you can see kind of right here in the 2008-2009 time frame where spending went through the roof and revenues went down because a lot of people were, uh, were, were losing money. And, uh, and ultimately, that's kind of where things got a bit out of whack. So again, right here, the, gosh, the, uh, the, the lines in the center show you the, the CBO baseline projection where, you know, in the long term, if you allow everything to expire, the revenues and, and spending come closer together. The dotted lines below and above show you the alternative projection where, where revenues continue to kind of grow at a slower pace and spending continues to, uh, to, to grow as well and we have a, a large deficit. So how does this affect everything here? That's kind of the, the, the backdrop to, uh, yeah, to, to, to this and, and really the, the year-end debates, right? You have right now provisions that have already expired from a tax perspective. So AMT relief, so the AMT patch, as they call it, to deal with, uh, with the patch for inflation, uh, which I believe if that were not dealt with, I believe the numbers go from about you know, 4 million taxpayers that are in AMT, I think roughly about 24 million will go into AMT if they didn't actually address the, uh, the, the AMT patch. You've got all the other you know, corporate business provisions, the extenders, you've got uh, bonus depreciation, which is not technically, I argue it's not technically an extender, but it's the 100% bonus has only happened once, but they do off and on do 50% uh, bonus depreciation. R&D credits, CFC look through on the subpart F international side. A lot of these items that are very important to, uh, mostly to, to businesses and both corporate and non-corporate, uh, but you know, those are kind of out there. And then you have the big items at year end expiring at the end of 2012. So really the extension of the 2001, 2003 individual tax cuts and the various limitations on itemized deductions, the estate and gift tax, uh, capital gains at the, uh, at the and dividends at the 15% rate at the highest. And, and a bunch of these items are expiring at year end. And so I guess in terms of, of uh, you, know, I, you know, pulling out my, my crystal ball, which is not a very good one, I mean, I think the, you know, the, the big question here, and it, it's very integrated, I'll look at this and say, okay, well, how do these all relate? And I'll tell you, there is an interrelationship between the individual rate cuts, the, the business extenders, as well as tax reform. And this is kind of how it's, you know, see it happening. Ultimately, the, the challenge right now is that the business extenders typically run about $37 billion a year to extend. So two years, you've got to go retroactive. If Congress does it like they did in 2010, they've got to go retroactive to the beginning of this year, plus another 12 months in, uh, you know, for next year, because they want to go ahead and deal with it for two years. So now you're at roughly, 
$74 billion. I think the AMT patch is another, another $90 billion to deal with. So you've got those, that, that, that eye of $74 billion. Well, Congress is not going to pass that on its own. And, and the reality is all the easy revenue raisers to use, the ones that uh, are not you know, overly controversial, they were already used before. So what you're left with are very controversial items. And so they're not going to move a bill. There'll, there'll be a bunch of noise. And you know, each house may pass a bill on its own. But they're not going to move a bill that just deals with the business extenders by itself. So that means that that business <coughs> extenders bill is likely going to move with the individual rate cuts. And the challenge there is that, and let's assume for a moment that, that the president is re, is, is reelected, President Obama is reelected, and then we'll assume the other scenario. You've got a situation to where, right, he has said never again. He extended the rate cuts, uh, you know, the original Bush tax cuts. He extended them, you know, again until the end of this year. And he said, I will do it for both those making 250 or less, as well as those, you know, making more than 250. But this is the only time I'm doing that. Not again. So, you know, he's kind of made that his his uh, you know his. Know, wedge issue to some extent that he's not going to do anything for those making 250 or more. Whereas Republicans are saying we want to extend it for everyone at least for another year, and uh, so and they're not going to be willing to do anything on it unless they're extending for everyone. So the problem as it relates to kind of the the individual rate, you know, the the corporate extenders is that what you could see is that the corporate extenders are going to be dealt with. They're going to be dealt with as a latch on to a broader bill that deals with the individual uh, rates, and so. Ultimately, you're gonna have some big bill that's likely going to move together. And the question is, can they come to some sort of resolution? My goodness, I'm pretty bad at this. Uh, <laughs> can they come to some sort of resolution in the lame duck session of Congress, which is really, the lame duck is the period after the elections. So right, what happens is, the elections are early in early November, people come back, a bunch of people are out of office, they spend a couple of weeks reshuffling their uh, who's in what office, who's losing office space, and you know, on top of that, they're supposed to deal with, with the, uh, the, the individual cuts, they're supposed to deal with everything else, the Medicare doc fix, the fact that you've got the sequestration of uh, $1.2 trillion in across the board spending that's gonna, you know, half of that's hitting defense, that's actually going to go into effect in January. So there are all these things that have got to be uh, dealt with by year end. That's where uh, you know, people, people typically call it the fiscal cliff. Uh, one of my colleagues decided that fiscal maelstrom sounded better. I think that's uh, debatable. That sounds pretty, uh, pretty rough as well. But that is the issue that's got to be dealt with. So some have said that if, if Obama's reelected, you actually might have a better chance for all these things to be dealt with by 1231 because they'll realize that basically, by and large, the same people that are sitting across from one another at the table uh, today are going to be the ones that are sitting across the table from each, early, from each other in 2013. Uh, however, there may be lesser chances for tax reform if that's the case because they'll deal with the extenders and continue to you know, you know, pass the ball down the, uh, the, the court for years to come. Uh, but you know, who knows whether or not the president is really going to make in his second term is going to make tax reform something that is initiative for him. On the other hand, if, if uh, Romney is elected and you know, the House and Senate say roughly close to one another, maybe the Senate is, you know, the, the Republicans take control of the Senate, but it won't be a filibuster-proof control, at that point, there may be a greater chance that nothing does get resolved by 1231. It may go on into early next year because the, you know, basically those with the winning hand, if it were the Republicans, are going to know that they're going to get a better deal in January or February, really February, when, uh, you know, when uh, you know, everyone new takes office. So that might be you know, a bleaker outlook for, you know, for extending the individual rates cuts as well as dealing with the corporate extenders before year end. But if you have everyone from... Uh, from, uh, from one party, that may actually be a greater outlook for purposes of something happening in tax reform. The counter to that is that some say that you need a second term president to be able to get through uh, tax reform because it uh, is so costly politically. So uh, we'll see what, uh, what happens there. So John, anything else you would touch on? Uh, yeah, I, th I think you have to separate this idea of tax reform from the, from the extenders and the, you know, the, the Bush tax cut. Because what a lot of people are talking about is actual reform of the of the code, simplifying it uh, and reducing the rates. And so I think there's virtually no chance of reform uh, in the short term. Uh, and the only chance you have is perhaps reform in a little bit longer. Term. Yeah, and what and where this does play in though is and it, it sounds very good, and we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, the House put out a bill just before the August recess to where they said, look, you know, we're going to go ahead. And it was simultaneous. They passed a bill that would extend all of the 2001, original 2001, 2003 individual tax cuts through the end of 13 to avoid the, the fiscal cliff, if you will. Uh, and at the same time, also dealt with the AMT patch as well as uh, 
you know, and, and ultimately I would envision they probably would add by the end of the day, they would add business extenders into that as well if that moved forward. But the plan was to pass that and say, all right, we are going to just go ahead and do this unpaid for, for another year. However, simultaneously they passed a bill that said that mandated for this fast track approach to tax reform. And it sounds very good, you know, in, at least, uh, you know, in theory to where, you know, the, the house would be responsible for, you know, for, you know, ways and means for generating a bill that would number one, it would uh, limit the individual tax brackets to 10% and 25%. It would re reduce the corporate rate to 25%. It would limit revenues as a percentage of GDP to 18 to 19%, which is typically a, 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 Repub a Republican congressional mantra. They really believe it should be there. Democrats really more 23 to 24%. And uh, it would permanently, re it would repeal AMT permanently as well as get to a territorial tax system to where for U.S. multinationals, foreign earnings wouldn't be taxed upon repatriation to the, uh, to the U.S. So a bill would have to be, re be produced by ways and means uh, that would then go to the chairman of the Joint Committee, which, oh, by the way, is Dave Camp, who also is the chairman of Ways and Means. So he would have to sign off on it that it did accomplish that. It would then go through the process on the House floor, go and go over to the Senate. There would be less of the, you know, there would be one final filibuster, but it would be a simplified process to where it would be more of a simple up or down vote on it after debate in the Senate. And the idea would be that you'd have some sort of tax reform by the end of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of 2013. And so the idea there is that would allow, if they did pass something like that, that would allow Congress maybe with a straight face to look at the American people and say, yes, we're extending everything again for another year unpaid for, maybe it's going to be another $800 billion bill unpaid for, but look, we've also passed a, you know, this expedited approach to tax reform, and over the next year we're going to try to clean everything up. And it does sound very good, and you know, maybe that will be the reality of the path forward, what Congress will do. I think the challenge is that if you look back at the 86 Act, it was actually, you know, after President Reagan, as well as he had bipartisan support from, you know, the House and the Senate, Everyone was on board for, uh, for tax reform. They had already put out the, uh, kind of the, the, the white paper there. It took two years to deal with the details of a proper tax reform in the code. So it, it makes you wonder, is it very realistic that Congress at the end of the year does, you know, that's fine, they pass an expedited approach to reform. Can they really do something uh, in that short of a time frame? Now, I will tell you that, you know, when I was up there, I was working on some aspects of international reform before I left, the Chairman Camp's territorial bill that was put out. but. There are a lot of other details. That's just on the, the, the international side. What about all the domestic uh, base broadeners that would need to be used to do a rate reduction? What about everything on the individual side? It's a, it's a real challenge. Well, in 86, too, you had a very popular president who, right. had, who had a lot of, uh, uh, was very good at using the bully pulpit. And so he could gather public uh, support for a tax reform. Right. And that, it remains to be seen if, if either of these candidates would, would have that kind That's of That's right. Plus, like, individual rates were through the roof. So he made it very clear and right to the American public that he was going to, you know, basically, he was going to reduce the burden on individuals. That was his mantra and shift it to uh, corporations. He also had the investment tax credit, which was, you know, he was able to, to basically, you know, get rid of that and use that to pay for an awful lot of things as well. So it's, it's a bit of a different environment now. You know, looking at this really in terms of kind of some of the factors of, of, of reform, you know, you, you know, people would say based on past history, you need, you know, presidential leadership there as someone, you know, you know behind it. Uh, President uh, Obama did put out kind of his proposal for business reform alone, I think, and, and really kind of focusing more on corporations. I think given the right that, you know, these days, I think in excess of 50% of business activity is operated through flow-through entities or on, you know, or individuals on their Schedule C. You've got more and more LLCs, S corps, uh, you name it. Uh, so it's it's very hard. I think that that others on the Hill and others have said, look, it's really not realistic. You cannot do business or corporate reform without also addressing individuals because, right there, you know, individuals are in businesses. So you know, how do you just, you know, if you really want to raise the revenue, are you really going to, you know, if you're going to do something on accelerated depreciation to repeal that? For corporations, well, what if you have a, a partnership that has, you know, a flow through and uh, an individual and a corporation that are engaged? It gets very complicated, and also it's not going to be very politically popular to take away from individuals, the the voters, to uh, to uh, to provide a uh, you know a lower rate reduction to corporations. So I think you know most most people behind the scenes acknowledge the fact that you need to deal with all this together. Um, really, there there is pressure though. There's a lot of discussion. The U.S. now has the the highest. Uh, you know, statutory rate in the world with Japan reducing their rate, the U.S. at 35% plus 
state gets you close to 40%. That's the highest in the world. And I think even if you look at effective tax rates, we're still up there, maybe not the highest, but pretty, pretty close. So there's a big pressure on U.S. international competitiveness. Uh, you know, and you know, there's a lot of debate on whether or not, you know, I think uh, you know, you know, academic scholars disagree as to whether or not that's something that's the idea of competitiveness is, is, is bogus or if it's, it's valid, but it's something that I will tell you in the past year has certainly you know, you know, taken hold on both sides of the aisle. So you know, the elected officials at least believe that it is a, an issue. And then you've got, as I mentioned before, the expiration of the, uh, of the tax cut. So that really could kind of you know, push things into uh, you know, expedited process of reform. I would tell you, though, the big issues are, is this going to be part of deficit reduction, or is it just going to be revenue neutral? Back in, in, 2000, in 1986, it was a revenue neutral uh, proposal. Um, however, it was not burden neutral, right? I just mentioned before, you shifted the burden from individuals to corporations. So how will they go about doing that now? Will they, you know, will it do something like that? Will it actually be burden neutral within corporate tax, but maybe what they'll do is the, the uh, you know, based on the individual provisions, it'll shift more of the cost to manufacturers and less to retailers or vice versa. And that's, uh, that's a big challenge because, right, if some of the big revenue raisers to pay for reform are basically repealing uh, maker's depreciation going back to more economic depreciation or repealing the Section 199 deduction. These are all things that have been discussed as base broadeners to pay for a reduced rate. Well, you know, who would be big winners if you actually got rid of accelerated depreciation and, uh, and the Section 199 deduction, presumably non-manufacturers, non-capital intensive companies. So financial services and retail industry would do quite well with giving up accelerated depreciation in 199 since they don't benefit for, from it to get a 25 or 25, 28% corporate rate. So those are all just some of the, uh, you know, some of the things to consider. You know, who's gonna bear the burden? What's the rate that's gonna be competitive? Is it 28 or 25% and so on and so forth. Um, and this slide, you know, going quickly through, it does give you a feel for kind of the, you know, the composition of the revenue base when you're looking at it. It's, uh, you know, it's interesting here, as much attention is paid in the media to the corporate income tax, it's clearly, and this, this speaks to why we, we do need reform on that side, is that you know, as far as being efficient and effective, it's, it's, it's really neither. If you look at it, the, the level is, is fairly low in terms of the, you know, kind of the percentage of GDP that's actually collected in terms of revenues of the corporate income tax. Obviously, individual income tax collects a lot more revenue. Uh, you know, payroll taxes, uh, you know, you know are, are certainly up there. Uh, the estate tax, although not specifically mentioned, has never been a, uh, a big revenue raiser, but that's very much about policy and progressivity and the, uh, the tax code is the, is the focus. So, uh, you know, just a couple other points. And you look at this, when you talk about is it realistic to do corporate reform with base broadening and how low of a rate you can get, is that e each 1% reduction uh, in the corporate rate reduces revenues, you know, the, the PRAB, the committee, the President's committee, showed, said it at 120 billion, the Joint Committee said 102 billion over, over a 10 year period. So at 35% going to, to uh, 25%, that's, you know, that's over a you know, trillion dollars that would cost ultimately reduce the rate to 25%. There's been a lot of discussion as to whether or not, you know, there really are enough provisions out there, these, these tax expenditures, there's really enough out there to where really you can get down to a 25% rate. So uh, I think other things, cost of a territorial tax system, going to a system to where foreign earnings of US multinationals are not taxed when repatriated. Uh, that's, I'll tell you, it shows here, depending on how it's done, this shows a range of $130 billion to $76 billion cost. I would tell you, based on some of the, you know, the insights that haven't been published that have been out there, there's a real concern given the buildup, and we'll talk about it shortly, of uh, indefinitely revested earnings overseas. I can tell you that you know, the latest discussion, there's a belief that if you were to go to a system, a, you know, go from a, an existing deferral system to where today, right, the U.S. doesn't tax foreign earnings until they come back to the U.S. unless they violate some of our anti-deferral rules. Uh, if you were to go to a true territorial system to where foreign earnings are not taxed at all or only a smidgen is taxed when it comes back, there's a concern that that would really increase the uh, incentive for U.S. multinationals to push even more earnings offshore and, you know, some would say more jobs offshore uh, because, right, if the money's earned offshore and then brought back, there's no tax on it or very little as opposed to if it's earned here, it's subject to full taxation even at a 25% rate. So I've heard numbers like $200 billion or $300 billion to even go to territorial. So try paying for that on top of a, you know, a 7% or a 10% rate reduction. It can be a challenge. So. 
Yeah, I think the, the view there, and some would say, wait a second, you've already got every multinational on the planet. If they can, they're already pushing you know, Google and Apple and everyone gets a lot of attention. They're, they, they've, they, they're already deferring a ton of earnings overseas. But I think the view is, okay, right, and that, you know, you know, yes, you defer a dollar long enough overseas, you know, the further you defer it, the closer it gets to an MPV of, uh, of zero, the closer to that when you actually bring the dollar back at some point in the future. The view is, okay, well, with, with a territorial system where the money's going to come back uh, tax-free, you know, that's, you know, an even better incentive, but you've got a lot of companies in the U.S. that are cash constrained. So maybe they need the money back in the U.S. and they can't today it doesn't really make sense for them to go through the rigmarole and all this planning to leave money offshore. They may need it back today and they couldn't do it. Well, but if, yeah, so now if it's gonna be a situation where as long as it's active earnings, we're going to, uh, you know, you know, got a incentive to earn it offshore, it may increase it. So the thought is, is that what you're gonna see is there may in fact be a territorial system, but in order to pay for that, you're gonna have a broadening of our subpart F anti-deferral rules, which is going to, you know, frankly, it may make companies today, many U.S. multinationals, worse off under a territorial system in the future than they are under present law, where they have the existing deferral rules, they have to run the traps of that, but, you know, frankly, they can leave their money offshore. So if you, if you make let more stuff passive uh, and therefore not eligible for territorial, then that means more is going to be currently taxed. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a uh, mess, because really it's the corporations who want a territorial system, but if you're going to make it worse for them by actually expanding the, the anti-deferral rules, they may not want it so much. But if at the same time, if we were to work more slowly, we'd start to reduce our taxes naturally so that we don't have to be taxed. That, that's right. And so the issue is, is, is and it's a good point, is what is a low enough rate, right? So 25 seems to be the, uh, you know, the, a lot, the number that a lot of people are coalescing around, 25%. You'd get it more aligned with the OECD averages. But, you know, admittedly, many of... Uh, the U.S. multinationals, right, that would be great for their U.S. income, but because they're earning money, a lot of money, let's say in Ireland at a 12.5% rate or through other planning, maybe their effective rate is actually down at, you know, 7 or 5%, you know, what are, you know, what is a low enough rate to actually, uh, you, know, you know, prevent that, that migration of profits offshore? So uh, I would say that would not be the official view of, of PwC on, on those matters, nor necessarily mine. I think that's, that's the argument against it. The other side is, right, if you do reduce the, uh, you know, the rate, and you get down to something more competitive, that will cause the rest of the world to invest more in the U.S. And frankly, if you look at our competitors, uh, the view there is, hey, all of them are, have realized that maybe the corporate tax is not really a good way to raise revenue. There should be a value-added tax or something else, and all the other, you know, countries in the OECD do have a value-added tax. So that's one of the other, you know, ideas that, okay, yeah, maybe territorial will cause this, but frankly, we need to be looking at another revenue source. So I guess that's to turn it over to... Uh, you for the remaining time that we, uh, that we can, have, well. unless you, uh, you know, I think, you know, really this is just a, a, a summary of some of the proposals that are out there. They're very, I think you're going to see, you know, something done with individual rates in the long term. I mean, we'll see if there is a reform. I think there is going to be, I do believe that both sides of the aisle, even though the president and the, their, their platform has not come out in favor of a territorial, uh, you know, you know, Bill, I do think behind the scenes, I think, there probably is agreement that the U.S. will eventually go to something territorial where foreign earnings that are active are not taxed. The question is how tough will it be? Is it going to be one to where there are lots of offsetting things and where multinationals need to pay for it themselves with maybe an expansion of our subpart F anti-deferral rules? Or, you know, it's going to be something that's a little more lenient. Uh, and then everyone discusses moving, reducing the rate to either 28% or 25% with base broadening, but, you know, quite frankly, no one wants to talk about the details of how you broaden the the, uh, the domestic tax base because that would be very politically unpopular in a, uh, an election year. So. I think one of the things to notice too is where are the big tax expenditures because that's the that's, only way they, yeah. that's the only way they pay for this. Well, that, that's right. So maybe this is one to, to point to quickly. You look at it, right? You've got makers uh, getting rid of accelerated depreciation for, econo for more economic depreciation. Uh, that's $500 billion repealing expensing of uh, research and experimental expenditures, R&E, 150 million, Section 199 repeal, 120. The problem there is that if you look at it, this is the corporate exp expenditures, the, uh, the business ones really amount to maybe, you know, you know a fraction of, uh, you know, maybe, you know, not even, you know, I would say not even a, you know, maybe a tenth 
of all the expenditures. The rest come in with individuals. So it's charitable contribution deductions, mortgage interest deduction, the employer provided health care exclusion. So that is the issue that, uh, that it's, it, it's gonna be a real challenge to pay for this. And there's no way you're gonna have a corporate rate reduction on the back of individuals. It's just politically not gonna happen and neither side is gonna support that. Yeah. Well, we could uh, talk a little bit about specifics of, uh, of uh, judgment. And I thought what I'd do here is, um, which one moves this? You oh, seem to, you. this guy, okay, this guy does. Okay. Something else moves it too. I think <laughs> yeah. yeah, seemed to have a mind of its own. So I thought what we do here is, uh, oh, let's see if we go back. Uh, basically just chat about three of the areas in, in tax accounting that where the most judgment is involved. Uh, we thought that this would be interesting from both a, a managerial viewpoint where you need to exercise judgment from an auditor viewpoint uh, in, in the sense of this is where your, where your task risks are. Um, so we're going to talk just briefly about uncertain tax positions, uh, indefinite reinvestment assertion, uh, and then value evaluation allowances. So mo and, and most of you probably have heard of these things before and, and have some background. Um, in terms of uncertain tax positions, basically these are positions in which you're not sure the tax benefit is going to uh, be accrued and you have a more likely than not standard that you apply. And of course, there's this uh, appropriate level of measurement, recognition and measurement, the two-step test. Well, I don't want to go through all the mechanics. Instead, I'd, what I'd like to do is kind of point out some things that, that you should probably focus on. One of the first things you should understand about uh, uncertain tax positions is you do need to document these things uh, in, in terms of being an auditor or a manager, you need to have a sufficient documentation to be able to identify both the uncertain tax position and to the, the extent that you're going to reserve for those. Um, this is where it comes in with, ta with tax reform and the various um, um, changes in the law. You need to be able to monitor those uncertain positions. And it's not just the legislative changes. You also have to monitor administrative and judicial changes. So it's like constantly uh, staying on top of this uncertain position, whether to uh, release the reserve or whether to increase the reserve. Um, another thing you have to do here that's, that's pretty interesting is you have to assume full knowledge by the taxing authority uh, of the relevant law and facts. And so in my own mind, being an empiricist, I, I wonder a little bit if this uh, uh, causes some over-reserving. We're seeing some pretty big uh, FIN 48 reserves and it's possible that may have something to do. In fact, I don't, uh, Kevin and I were chatting about this earlier, uh, that what may be happening here, are, our companies are actually over-reserving because of FIN 48. Yeah, and I don't, and I, I do believe that they're trying to get to the right answer, but you know, one area that's a real challenge you know, we see is saying that I, I'm guessing is a big one, is in the space of transfer pricing. So you've got intercompany pricing, and so you've got, and I, you have economists that come in and determine, the, you know, here's the price going from the U.S. to my Canadian subsidiary, and ultimately, you know, here's the price that we're going to charge, and maybe the appropriate range on the sale of this product is maybe it's a markup between 2 and 5 percent. So as long as you're within 2 and 5 percent, that's something that is acceptable. But we know with transfer pricing, that's something that always goes to audit and is always challenged. Uh, we're gonna, we know that there's there's going to be some sort of settlement there with the IRS. We're doing two. They want four. We're going to up at three. So every year we're going to set up, they start off the first year, you know, some reserve at, you know, 1% of X amount. And you can see over time, that's, you know, that the next year they set up, a, you know, there's no, no facts have changed. They're going to set up a reserve on 1% of X amount. It continues to build and build. And, you know, next thing you know, you know, if you haven't had an, an audit and the foreign tax authorities or the IRS haven't focused on it, uh, you know, frankly, it continues to build and build. Yeah, eventually the statute closes, but then once the statute closes, you say, well, this wasn't challenged, or oh, by the way, maybe we did better than we thought, and so you end up taking down a huge reserve. And yeah. so it's, uh, I, I think it's, a lot of it is very mechanical. It's, uh, it's well intended, but. Yeah, yeah. and so anyway, it's, it's an interesting question. It, you notice I didn't, the last one, I didn't touch this thing and it changed. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not us. But we want to talk just briefly about effective settlement. Uh, basically what happens here is at what point do you release that reserve? And the, the point that's in the codification is the term effective settlement. Essentially this, this means that you believe that position has been settled, whether on appeal or through litigation. Obviously if it's been litigated and you have a final uh, disposition of it, you have settlement. But you could, see, you could at some point uh, have to use judgment to assume it's effectively settled. 
Typically what they do is they, they uh, think about examination. Has the examination been completed? Are there, is there any remote chance that it will be re-examined? Uh, is there some uh, potential for appeal or dispute resolution? All of those things have to, be, have to be resolved in order for you to have effective settlement. Now, understanding what effective settlement does here is you're releasing the reserve. So essentially that's going to give you quite a tax benefit. So that, again, judgment's very important here. Um, one of my uh, favorite areas is indefinite reinvestment. And uh, let's see if I can get this guy to go. Now it won't work. Here's a, this slide has a little bit of background. Perhaps some of you know this. If, if you have earnings offshore, uh, typically what you have to do is you have to accrue a, a tax liability uh, to represent the taxes when those uh, earnings are repatriated uh, domestically. Well, the indefinite re uh, reinvestment assertion allows you to basically to avoid having to accrue any taxes on that. And so it's really just a book entry. It doesn't have any tax effect per se. Um, the, the current landscape, though, is pretty interesting here. Some of you may have seen a report by J.P. Morgan here recently that said that 60% uh, of liquidity for multinational corporations actually sits offshore. And the study, uh, actually I looked this up before we came over, 602 multinationals actually have almost a trillion dollars of cash offshore, according to the disclosures this year. And Apple, of course, is the poster child for this. They disclose they have 74 billion offshore. That's cash offshore, and that's 60% of their cash in total. So you can't repatriate it because uh, not only does it trigger a tax liability, but it, more importantly, it triggers a tax expense. And unless you make this indefinite reassertion, indefinite reinvestment assertion, uh, you'd have to accrue the expense number. Yeah. Tying um, that back to tax reform, you can imagine why many U.S. multinationals either want a temporary holiday again, which happened back you know, with the American Jobs Creation Act uh, uh, in you know, 2004 time frame, to really, uh, you know, to be able to bring back all their foreign earnings, it may be an 85% dividends received deduction, or alternatively go to a territorial system where you can freely move cash back, and they argue for it. The downside is, you know, what's going to be used to pay for that? So valuation allowances, and we have a couple of extra slides here, but what I'll do is basically point out to you that if a company has deferred tax assets, these are typically unused credits or carry, loss carry forwards, uh, especially when they are showing a net DTA position, that is their deferred tax assets are greater than their deferred tax liabilities, then you have to consider a valuation allowance, which is a contra asset. And there's positive and negative evidence, and I, I won't bother to cover those. Instead, what I want to do is kind of get to the payoff here, is when can you release the valuation allowance? This is very similar uh, to any val uh, valuation allowance release. What's going to happen is it's going to go directly through the income, in this case through uh, tax benefit. What's interesting here is, is exactly what does it take to get a release. And again, it's an area of, of judgment. Looking back at the, the weight of the evidence, you're supposed to weigh the, the, uh, the negative evidence against the positive evidence to make this evaluation. And so obviously, there's a lot of judgment involved. The last question I was going to ask here is, a, is a partial release possible? Uh, unlike um, if you think about accounts receivable, uh, you can think about a, a receivable that's partially collectible, and you might have a partial release of the allowance. But here, basically, it, it takes special circumstances to have a valuation allowance that has a partial release. Uh, essentially, you're valuing an asset, the DTA, and it's either, either uh, uh, been uh, 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 reserved or it hasn't. That's right. And oftentimes, NOLs, capital losses, maybe there's been a you didn't think you were going to be able to use them before the expiration period, but then all of a sudden maybe, you know, the foreign government extended the expiration period, the carry forward period for a few more years, so maybe there's a release as a result of that. Uh, but it's a, you know, this is a very touchy area. And uh, I guess a member of your, your faculty now, uh, you know, Jeff Johans, who's teaching here, actually was, uh, not to put him on the spot, but he was our national office, and I remember we would actually, he would be on the front line when the audit teams would go and actually consult, and these would get very emotional. I mean, very emotional issues for companies and for the, the audit teams, right? They want to release that valuation allowance, or alternatively, they don't want to have to put up a valuation allowance. And of course, the local account team, I, I would be on your, you know, your, 
you're pushing back and forth to the client, but naturally you, you, you feel like a little bit of an advocate. And you'd have to call the national office who's responsible for all quality of the, uh, the firm to make sure that uh, you know, we don't get in trouble with the SEC or PCAOB. And you'd have these consults where they would really push back on you the way they're supposed to. And so he had the, uh, the pleasure or the, uh, you know, maybe the, uh, you know, not so much fun of having to uh, deal with many uh, consults and, and, and addressing all of that. I know I retired. What's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and one of the things I, I think that you're that they uh, uh, that they look at closely, at least when I was at the SEC, you look at the projections you're making in your financial statements, and you ask, are you making those same projections for your valuation allowance projections? Uh, and so, you know, it, uh, you, what you want to do is be consistent. I think uh, to have the strongest case, but yeah, okay. in all these areas, it's judgment, it's facts and circumstances, and so. Uh, I can't imagine how difficult it, it could be to audit as as well as management. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right. Multiple jurisdictions. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. and constantly moving. Yep. And then projections are in terms of the evidence of whether or not you need evaluation allowance or can release. I, you know, projections are move, of those things you look at. It's it's the. It, it, you don't want to have to rely upon projections, ideally. You want to show that you have other deferred liabilities that are turning or tax planning ideas or other things there because, right, you're kind of in looking in terms of evidence, projections are considered to be the most subjective. So uh, I found that typically when we were having to call the national office and pointing just to the client's projections as being very rosy as to why they should be able to release a valuation allowance, you know, I think the people on the other end of the line were oftentimes trying not to laugh at you. So, uh, but there were circumstances when you looked at, I mean, I had a, you know, the where, you know, based on kind of looking at core earnings and uh, that maybe there were anomalies that actually, you know, I've seen circ circumstances to where based solely on projections, evaluation allowance could be, be released, but it's a very touchy area. Yeah. In, yeah, in, in many circumstances, and in fact, in probably oftentimes that is, by and large, that is the case with a couple of, Kevin and I will hang around for questions if you have if you have more or and of course I will bring Jeff in as a real expert in this area. Uh, so thank you for your attention and um.